All right. Uh, what makes Calvin Candy one of the most terrifying villains in film history? Oh, baby, I can't wait. What makes you such a Mandingo expert? I'm curious what makes you so curious. Oh. This is Calvin Candy, and he is one of Tarantino's most reprehensible and terrifying characters. Calvin Candy is written less like a plantation owner and more like a psychopathic Roman emperor oh, who yeah. has become drunk with power. And it's DiCaprio's incredibly new- Oh my god, I forgot about this scene where the dudes are fighting in like the living room or some shit and the dude kills the other dude. And he's sitting there like it's a like a dog fight or something. And he's all proud of his it was like top dog or something. This was crazy to watch for like the first time. I was like, what the hell is happening? And I was like, oh my God. Nuanced performance that distills all of this grandiosity, murder and hatred into a character that feels very real in very horrible ways. Uh, Go on, uh, finish it. Uh, uh. A good actor must live, undeniably, in the truth of the moment despite the imaginary yeah. circumstances surrounding them. And sometimes those imaginary circumstances can be so unfathomably cruel yeah. and awful that it can be hard to watch. Before we get started, don't forget- Bro, like a lot of the times in this movie, a lot of the subjects are very taboo, but that's what makes Tarantino movies so awesome is that it's not so over the top um grotesque or something but it's right on that edge of oh it's too much but he, he's not crossing the line and he skirts that so well in in this movie Don't forget to like and subscribe to nerdstalgic if you haven't done so already django unchained is the seventh film in the tarantino canon of yep. work didn't he say he was only going to make 10 films and then he's out because he doesn't want his old man movie making thoughts to come through in his, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 films. I think that's about the reasoning he, he wanted, he said. The film is centered around the titular protagonist, Django, played by Jamie Foxx, who is a slave freed by a dentist turned bounty hunter named Dr. King Schultz, played by Christoph Waltz. Yeah. The two embark on a journey and deceive a wealthy and brutal southern slave owner named Calvin Candy in an effort to... <laughs> and the thing that, with this movie, that, that Tarantino does, that adds levity to the scenes, is the crash zooms. Like, zoom in. <laughs> I think Channel 5 did this uh, when some crazy person was talking or whatever. But it's kind of funny when you see like a AAA movie director using these kind of like funny concepts in filmmaking. Just to add like just to make um, just to make sure that you as an audience member know it's not. It's not real, all right? It's not too serious. It's just a movie. It's a fake story, okay? As opposed to the like, the Marvel formula where it's serious, serious, and then break the seriousness with a joke. Serious, serious, joke, joke, serious, joke, joke, snarky, uh, sarcastic, that kind of deal. It doesn't always have to be like that. But there are other things that you can do for filmmaking that just, hey, just remember, boom, you know, he just zooms in on his face. To free Django's wife, Broomhilda, played by Kerry Washington, from a life of servitude at Calvin Candy's estate. Hey, little troublemaker. You silver tongued devil, you. <laughs> it's heavily inspired by the spaghetti western genre and is loosely based on the 1966 film Django, directed by Sergio Corbucci. What? This is news to me. I had no idea that this movie existed before Django Unchained. Wait, so <laughs> this is kind of like the, the like Django 1 and then Django Unchained is kind of Django 2, I guess. 
That's pretty cool. I did not know that. Gucci. Quentin Tarantino is known for delivering stylized genre films that don't pull any punches when it comes to blending nuanced and intriguing dialogue with gritty violence in a way that feels filled with style, symbolism, and meaning. This is all part of what makes a Tarantino film great, but none of that would be possible without hiring the absolute best talent available. Calvin oh, yeah. Candy is the first character that Tarantino has ever gone on record to say that he actually hates. In an interview with Playboy magazine, God dang, that is kind of rare because the, most of the time, whenever you create something and you see it over and over again, it kind of loses its effect or intended effect on the, the audience. But since you see it every day, you're kind of numb to it. I wonder if he made the character just, I don't know, so good or whatever that he's like, holy shit, I hate this guy. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Tarantino stated, I hate candy, and I normally like my villains no matter how bad they are. Tarantino's catalog of completely reprehensible characters is quite long. Zed from Pulp Fiction, oh, yeah. Bill from Kill Bill, and of course Hans Landa are all about as horrible as a person could possibly imagine. Oh, For yeah. Tarantino to say that this is the character that made him uncomfortable is actually quite a statement. From the outset, Calvin Candy is conveyed to us as a disgusting... <laughs> that little intro with the crash zoom him uncomfortable is actually quite a statement from the outset calvin Boom. candy is <laughs> like that's the intro just crash zoom because the crash zoom is meant to be a, a, a comedic thing and <laughs> but i know it like whenever i watch a movie and i see a crash zoom i automatically think oh this is probably a tarantino movie because no other movies just slam the zoom button and go voom. <laughs> he is conveyed to us as a disgusting and brutal maniac. The first scene in which Calvin Candy is introduced gives us everything we need to know about this character. Megalomania is reaching out of the screen. Or the, the, the crash, like, opposite of zoom. Like, back off? I don't know. <laughs> ...and punching us in the face as Dr. King Schultz and Django aren't even given a moment to speak before Calvin Candy demands them to address him. Why do you want to get in the Mandingo business? You don't intend to allow your second to make the proper introductions? It is very clear to us that this room, with its blood-stained floors, yeah. billiard table, wet bar, and comfortable seating, is Calvin Candy's throne room. And it is yeah. a testament to his inhumane brutality and complete sociopathy. The setting here is quite disturbing, mostly because of how sparsely attended and intimate this fight actually is. It's just Yeah, you're right there. Like a first person perspective. Well, not a first person perspective, but the fighting is happening within arm's reach of the characters. And supposedly you're supposed to be the audience is supposed to be observing the movie through. Uh, I think it was Dr. Schultz's point of view and Django's point of view. So when they just walk up and take a seat like right there, that's like the audience is like right there, right on top of the fight. And it's like, geez, just Calvin Candy and one other guy watching two slaves fight to the death while they sip on tea cocktails five feet away. You can almost smell. Bro, this is literally like the boys sitting down in front of the TV watching a football game. But instead of football, it's just two dudes fighting <laughs> this room. We're processing so much disgust during this scene, it's almost hard to track the narrative. There are some quick cutaways. But to be fair, I would say that uh, this is not too uh, different than, than real life whenever two people in the street are, just break out in a fight. Obviously, there's going to be a crowd starting, but not so close like these guys just pulling up in chairs, you know. <laughs> so it's not too different. <laughs> in real life when two people are fighting ways to the reactions of calvin candy he, he tries to bring some class to uh the the barbaric scene that is unfolding in front of you slaves during the sequence which serve as an extremely efficient reminder that anyone in this room who isn't white is filled with anxiety and fear candy's response to these grotesque events playing out is that of a person riding a roller coaster yeah Outside of Candy displaying all of this violent hedonism over the bloodshed, we begin to understand that this is an egotistical flex over Dr. King Schultz and Django. Showing them what he is capable of instills fear in them before yeah. beginning the sales negotiation for which they have come. 
The choices that DiCaprio makes here as a performer? I mean, yes, it is a flex, but it's kind of unintentional because I wasn't like, was he really setting up the fight for them to just walk in on it? Or was them walking in just like an accidental like, oh, hey, you're doing this right now. Should I leave? <laughs> no, just come on and join in. It's like, OK. <laughs> are very small and incredibly powerful. The dialogue is minimal and the eye contact is everything as Candy sizes up Django and King Schultz's tolerance for cruelty. The cherry on top is that DiCaprio is able to sprinkle in some amusement behind these monstrous antics in a way that amplifies the horror of this scene three times over. Yeah. Candy enjoys these displays of savagery and he enjoys observing the effects that they have on others. And it's not necessarily the acts themselves that terrify us, but the established normalcy of them. Throughout the rest of the film, we delve deeper and deeper into Calvin Candy's depravity. In route to Candyland, Calvin orders oh. his henchmen to Oh, this scene. This was another like hard to watch scene. Oh. To allow their dogs to eat a slave alive for underperforming in a fight. The first time we see Broomhilda, she is being hauled out of a sweat box for attempting to escape. He later orders Broomhilda to remove her clothes at the dinner table to show his guests the scars from a beating he administered to her for trying to run away, referring to them as It's like a painting. Look at that. So this is a good example of show don't tell the audience. So you want to show the audience what the villain is capable of. Don't just come out and say what he is capable of. You know, actions speak louder than words, all right? And this is just a great example of what happened or the after effects. Calvin! All of this reprehensible, tortuous megalomania culminates in this climactic scene in which Calvin Candy discovers Django and King Schultz's ruse through the help of his head of house slave, Stephen, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. Prior to this scene, Stephen was seen as little more than a bumbling sycophant. Oh, yes, sir. I miss you like a, like a hog miss flop. But in this room, we see that Stephen is more intelligent than Calvin himself. Oh, yeah. Them motherfuckers ain't here to buy no mandingos. When Stephen finally convinces Calvin of the current ruse occurring under his roof, we see Calvin's blood boil. Based on our earlier understanding of this character, which is really good because it shows you the two sides of Samuel L. Jackson's character of, you know, obviously he's like the house guy, the butler or whatever. So he has to put on a front, you know, kind of to the public, which is one face. But then on a one on one instance, he is a little more insightful and doesn't act so kind of silly. So it just is just another layer to the character, essentially. Character, he is a man who commanded his dog to eat a human being alive over a matter of just a few hundred dollars. So who knows what he is going to be able to do to people actively defrauding him over thousands of dollars in his own home. When Calvin re-enters, we are expecting him to exhibit outward rage. But what we get is almost the exact opposite. Calvin enters with a frightening amount of confidence due to his new understanding of the situation at hand. Well, yeah, he knows that he is in control of the situation. Now that he discovered their motives and why they're here, what he he now controls how much, I don't know, money he's going to, you know, going to want to want from them now. So, he's in the driver's seat essentially. It's a subtle shift. DiCaprio is able to show us that this character is barely containing his anger as he reaches into his apothecary bag and places a human skull on the table. We have no idea what is about to transpire, but we know it's not going to be very good. After weaving the tale of the slave to whom this skull belonged, Candy begins the less than hospitable act of aggressively sawing into the skull of a former slave. This is all done in an attempt to psychologically justify white supremacy. He breaks into the back of this skull to prove his point scientifically. The area associated with submissiveness is larger than any human or any other subhuman species on planet Earth. 
This deranged, misguided, and insane viewpoint is all derived from a man who owns slaves who he abuses and murders with reckless abandon. This tonal shift indicates to our protagonist- Yeah, th th that little part was an attempt because obviously this is like set back in the day. So back in the day, you could, pro you could pretty much justify- like, as long as it looks sciency, you can kind of justify it by saying some sciency shit. And it's like, well, how exactly? Ah, oh, you don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's science, you know, it's back in the day science. <laughs> like, this was the, about, probably about the same time where they thought is, if you're sick or something, just stick leeches all over yourself and it'll suck the disease out of you. That's probably about the same thing. And then also, there were probably those little buggies where uh, it was like the the little sickness tonic of like, hey, just drink one, one of these every day and you'll be cured of all your illnesses. You know, that kind of era. That clearly the jig is up. When Candy threatens to break Django's skull open, Django and Schultz leap from their seats in terror only to be met with the barrel in. Oh, that when he when he slammed his hand. I wonder if he'll he'll mention this. That the hand slam, I think he slammed his hand on some glass and now his hand is bleeding. But Leo was just so into the scene, he just kept it rolling. End of a shotgun. Candy then explodes, Wait. smashing his hand down on a glass in an Oh yeah, there it was. All right, let me go back. Let me go back. One more time. It's in terror only to be met. With what? There's a glass that happened like right there. And he's just like BAM! with the barrel end of a shotgun. Candy then explodes, smashing his hand down on a glass in an explosion of rage. This glass was not a prop, by the way. Leonardo DiCaprio unintentionally yeah. smashed his hand into this glass, puncturing his palm on the stem on the way down, so all of the blood coming out of Damn. his hand at this point is 100% real. This take actually broke Jamie Foxx out of character, and Tarantino's initial oh, response to the moment really? was that Leonardo DiCaprio planned the stunt out and used a fake blood rig. This is largely because DiCaprio didn't miss a single beat and incorporated the injury into the scene. This is where DiCaprio- That was a great scene. I thought it. When I first saw that, I thought that was intentional. I had no idea that that was an accident. And him mentioning that Jamie Foxx broke character? Like, I, I don't know. It Maybe he said he did, but what happened on camera is like, it, he still looked at character to me. He was just a little uh, surprised. Caprio's intelligence as a performer truly shines. Instead of yelling to cut and calling for a set medic, Leonardo DiCaprio embraces the performance philosophy of there are no mistakes, only new opportunities. Yeah. He uses his injury to further fuel his character. It's incredibly effective. Naturally, when the camera cut, DiCaprio received necessary medical attention before they resumed filming the remainder of the scene. So he didn't. Oh, wait, did he like slather her with his... There's no way that this is at this point after the scene take. He probably cleaned up and then resumed, like put fake blood on his hand and then smeared it all over her because that's what happens right here. I forgot actually smear his own blood all nah. over Kerry Washington's face, but this incident speaks to the level of emotional yeah. depth DiCaprio brings to his performances. The emotions he is portraying are true and real. They are only delivered through imaginary circumstances. The scene at Candyland has now transitioned from something tense and dangerous to something straight out of American Psycho. The word unhinged just doesn't quite begin to cover what is being conveyed through DiCaprio's performance. Humanity has left his eyes, as Candy explains that he is ready. Well, humanity didn't really leave his eyes because he never thought that slaves were people in the first place. So he's just doing his normal thing. He <laughs> and willing to bludgeon Broomhilda to death with his hammer, and will do so with great pleasure if they do not accept his new offer of $12,000 for Broomhilda and Broomhilda alone. Once Candy gets paid, he brings the hammer down away from her and closes the deal. Then, somehow DiCaprio is able to seamlessly morph back into his charming southern persona. If you care to join me in the parlor, we will be serving white cake. <laughs> There's so much H on the word white. White cake. <laughs>
DiCaprio delivers a performance so strong a viewer can actually have a physical reaction to how much they hate him in the hands of a lesser performer. Calvin Candy may not have worked at all. Bro, do never haggle with this man. Ever. This guy is the king of hagglers. <laughs> Emotional intelligence is everything when it comes to delivering a performance, and DiCaprio has an innate ability to navigate uncharted territory in the human psyche in order to deliver the frightening realism necessary to bring this character to life. I will have you know, there is no one in the game that appreciates the value of showmanship more than Monsieur Calvin J. Candy here. Nobody. That's it for this one, folks. Don't forget Dang. to let us know what- Calvin Candy was such a good bad guy. You love to hate him. You think in the comments section below. You might see a couple of links to some of our other videos in the player window here, so if you need a palate cleanser, that might be a good place to start. Like and subscribe Dang. if you haven't done so already, and thanks for watching Nerdstalgic. What a great freaking video. Just a little breakdown of the character of Calvin Candy. God dang. I might have to go watch that again later or something. It was such a good movie. Man, that's all I gotta say, really. It's just, god dang. <sighs> but, you know, I'm kind of new to nostalgic and I'm the video is a year old, but it's still good. I like it. You know, I want to I wanna go see some more stuff. Definitely. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. All right, guys, take it easy. Later.